Hi, Filmatics. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Irene Dreyer. She's a longtime executive producer for the Disney Channel, WB, the CW, and ABC Family Freeform. And she's also known for being the executive producer of the longest running show on the Disney Channel, The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody and The Sweet Life of Di On Deck. So I want to welcome Irene to the show. Irene, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here amongst the movie addicts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to ha have you join us, Irene. Irene, so you, we are recording live from Los Angeles today. So um, are, are you planning anything for the holidays? You know, we, it's very, very bad here in the COVID world where we just found out today there's 0% capacity in any hospital in Los Angeles. So I have a feeling come Monday, um, we are gonna go back to really serious lockdown. It's, it's really a shame, but that's what happens when people don't wear masks and they don't behave, you know? Yeah, and um, I just I just want to wish everyone uh, just you know please be yeah. healthy and stay safe yeah. and um, just do do what's right for you and your family. But here yeah. on the show, we hope that we can bring you a little happiness and a little joy Absolutely. and a little humor <laughs> by connecting to people in the most uh, you know safe way as possible by remote and. Um, yeah. And, sure. and and that's the only thing we can do right now is hopefully by sharing our stories, um, it'll inspire you to, you know, um, either enjoy something that's uplifting for your family or even possibly go on your path to being a creator. Um, Irene, yeah. I, I wanted to know growing up, was there a favorite film of yours? Well, I went to the movies every Saturday growing up and I'm from Orlando, Florida, very small town then. Disney World was not even a twinkle in Walt's eye, okay? It was nothing. So that was my escape. But in Orlando, the, we didn't get like the really big, you know, impactful Academy Award films in the day. So I would go because my favorites were Elvis, don't laugh everybody, Elvis Presley movies and the blanket bingo i wanted to be a dancer and that is where i saw dancing is in those movies i mean and margaret and viva las vegas are you kidding that was going to be me that or at least that's what i thought um same thing as frankie and annette they were dancing on the beach with i mean that was my world that is what i aspired to be when i said okay I'm leaving Orlando. I got to go try and uh, make this happen as a dancer. So those kind of movies I gravitated to, and they inspired my initial decision. You know, one time my mom tells this story. I have a sister who's a little over uh, a year plus younger than I. So she dropped us off. Those are the days you could be dropped off at the movies. Dropped my sister and I off because they were playing Gone with the Wind and Love in a Goldfish Bowl with Sandra D and James Darren. So my mother would say, I dropped them off on Saturday and I picked them up on Sunday because <laughs> that was like six hours of movie. <laughs> but um, so yeah, those kind of movies in, in my beginning years of appreciating you know, film was things that I completely connected with. You know, seeing these people dancing on the beach with fringe on their dresses and singing. I mean, what else is there? <laughs> you know? And it was such a good babysitter for kids. Six hours. You would just be, oh my gosh, beach blanket bingo. You know what? I saw an old uh, Elvis movie and it, they're really good. They're dancing and the girls are screaming and it's a good time. Oh my God. Yeah, totally. And I just, we, we saw recently a, series um, of episodes that was about uh, Colonel Parker, you know, Elvis's manager. And he was not a American citizen. He never could get a green card. And this made me so mad. That is why Elvis begged to go on tour, begged, 
and everybody wanted him to. But Colonel Parker said no, because he was afraid if he left the country, he wouldn't get back in. And that like crushed me. I mean, <laughs> that that just made me so, so very sad that someone would be so narcissistic and not allow your client. He, he would have been uh, even bigger than he was. And he was big in the United States. And that was kind of it. But you know, he, he spoke to me. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he spoke to a lot of women. In <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know something, Marilyn, and, and to everybody that is, is listening, when you, you know, I was very intrigued by the movie Addicts. You know, growing up, Addicts, in, in many cases, wasn't necessarily a positive description of something. It was always negative. But movies were the escape and as addicts, you know, they were trying to find their escape. But at the end of the day, you get lost in movies, which is the positive side. And when you get so connected and you want to see it over and over again, that is a very positive thing. Except, you know, nowadays when you talk about movies, we used to go to the theater to see movies. Well, nowadays, movies, as opposed to television that you watch at home, you're now watching movies at home. When I've been um, producing and finding projects, film or television, you would say, here's a script that's a feature film. And then you would get another script and it would be a TV movie that was two hours. So now all, all that is under one canopy that you are watching movies that you watched in the theater in your living room. And it's very different because now the Academy Awards, which have been pushed to April, hopefully, all the movies that are gonna be up for awards are 99% from um, your streamings on that you watch on television. It's a very odd you know, time to be able to label things. People are trying to figure that out. You know, in the early days, there was, um, when you'd watch a show that had a different uh, multiple episodes, those were called, um, you know. Movies of, um, movies of the week? I'm blanking what they're calling it. They're, yeah. <clears throat> so then, wait, what? I'm completely, wait, I'm going to, movies of the week, that's what it was. They were mini series. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my mind for a minute. They were mini series. And now they're listed in this day and age as a limited series. It's the same kind of thing that there's eight episodes, 10 episodes, and you're not committed to seven years. When you, when you sell a show, you have to sign for seven years. Um, and if it gets canceled, it gets canceled, but you know, very, very interesting time. You know, I've spent most of my time, you know, in, um, family programming. When I left California, that was really hard decision, but there was nothing there for me. My mom was a singer. I was involved in theater. She did like 28 shows. So I had a lot of, you know, information and, and love of, of living in that kind of world. But there wasn't anything in Orlando when I was growing up. And I wasn't even aware that you could now, which you can now, go to college to be an editor, a producer, a writer, a director. I was not exposed to any of that. Had I known, I do believe I would have taken a different path. But I came out to LA <laughs> uh, with a roommate from college and Marilyn and I found out that we both went to the same college, University of Florida, go Gators. And mm -hmm. um, I know. I, <laughs> so my dream was on the Carol Burnett show. Okay, don't laugh. I am not that young, but I'm not that old. So <laughs> anyways, 
So my girlfriend and I, we went to the farmer's market in Los Angeles, the original, not the one at the Grove that's all fancy schmancy. And I remember that I never saw vegetables that were not in a styrofoam container with saran wrap over the top. Because in Florida, you would, you know, bugs all the time. So there would be like four apples saran wrap in styrofoam. They had corn. And, you know, if you know the music to um, Oklahoma, the, the corn and the breeze and, and all the husk and everything up. And I was like, oh, my God, we're going to go home and make this. Then I see around the corner, it's next to CBS. Well, Carol Bonaccio was on CBS. I have to go there. <laughs> so we snuck in. Mind you, in the day, which you can, I mean, we had bodyguards with with um, bulletproof vests in front of Sweet Life, because that's what happened many years later. So I'm walk, we're walking in and we go, there's a guard. We crawl on our hands and knees, very Lucy and Ethel, with the corn sticking up. And we ran, found an elevator, pushed the number, and it took us to Carol Burnett's stage. I was like apoplectic. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna like do this. Anyways, they saw us and Lyle Wagoner came over and we told him how, you know, my story. And he introduced me to Ernie Flatt, who was the, the choreographer then. And anyways, he said, well, then you'll come and be my guest tomorrow because we saw security people going around ready to tell us to like leave the studio. And then when we came the next day, the guard said, oh, no, 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 <laughs> you guys I don't think so. The corn ladies. I but know you two. We're guests. And he dialed and he goes, okay. And so let us in. I mean, it was just, you know, that was a dream in those days, true. that's what you had to do. Wow. So your dream anyway. of going to the Carol Burnett show, sneaking in, in with husk of corn turns out to where you meet where you meet uh, the key person that invites you back as proper guests where you don't have to crawl on your hands and knees and you can be dressed up and walk in elegantly i love that story that's amazing <laughs> that's dedication you know, i was doing an interview and somebody they asked me how did you get the talent and how did you approach things? I mean, yes, that that's a story, but that kind of was significant of me. What, what, how can you describe this? I said, I can describe it in one word, chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> chutzpah. Which means I have, I have balls to do what I decided to do. <laughs> and, you, and you have been responsible for discovering some key shows and incredible talent. Can you tell us the story of how you discovered um, a particular person? I won't give it away, but it begins with a B. I, our listeners will yeah, love yeah, yeah. this story. You know, somebody, I, I, again, I've been, you know, interviewed over the years and they ask me, you know, how do you tell? How do you know somebody has talent? And my response is, if I can market them. So in my early, early career, I happened to meet someone that introduced me to a game show part guy, and I ended up doing game shows in, in the beginning. And then I met someone through, you know, whatever else I was doing. He was starting a management company. And I said, oh, I'll do that, not knowing. So I ended up taking over the management company. And so I was signing a lot of talent and, and a couple of writers then. And then 1988, was the worst writer strike and I had to close my office because it was 10 months. And you know, you gotta keep paying rent and phones and parking, et cetera. So I saw this story on television about this African American man who started the uh, Midnight Basketball League. And I'm like, okay. He realized that the most vulnerable island place in Chicago where this took place. All of the worst crimes happened after midnight. So he created the Midnight Basketball League. 
And he was appointed by the president. I mean, all kinds of amazing. It was really, really amazing. I looked at it and said, I can sell that. And I did with Andre Brower starring. So I said, you know, I, I think I have a good eye. So when I, after I closed the management company, I managed at one point uh, an actor who's no longer with us, Roddy McDowell. Okay, everybody knows who he is. Aww. And he was best friends with every famous movie star there was. So I had an idea to do a coffee table um, book, but that's a video, coffee table video. They were just starting. It was Jane Fonda and her exercise and a couple of others. So what I did was I think we are going to have famous people talk about famous people. Great. I found a producer. He had a company, coffee table videos. I had George Harrell taking the photos. It was amazing. So I'm interviewing in New York, Lauren Bacall, Myrna Loy, Greer Garson, John Houston, et cetera. And I'm freaking out, you know, totally freaking out. Oh my God. And I realized, I, I know, I was like, I, oh, I, you know, Catherine Hepburn, you know, I wanted to go, it's a pleasure to meet you, but you know, anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I'm a big T Turner classic movie fan, black and white, any one of those stars, I've watched every one of those movies. I love so those too. The black and white, black and white Criterion oh, collection, right. all that stuff. Yeah, all night long popcorn, mm -hmm. binging. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so then I realized, you know, maybe I can do this producing thing. I had a lot of fun doing that. So I ended up getting a job someplace at a production company. And I knew this agent and she says, I have these, this young boy that has a deal at NBC and he was six. His name was Taj Maori. I said, I want to meet him. So I met him. He was, like I said, six. I said to the agent, I want to make a deal with him. He's unbelievable. I mean, amazing. Well, he's got a deal for a Patti LaBelle series. I'll take second position. Well, he's got a second position on full, full house. Okay, I'll take third position. There's no such thing. And I said, is there anybody else at home? Just kidding. And she opened her wallet and the size of a postage stamp were these two twin girls, Tia and Tamara, who were 10 or 11. I want to meet them. They came into my office. I knew was, I knew the second they walked in, I knew it. I can market them. We had the best time. I became 12 and sold it to ABC Network. We were on for one season. And then all the Lorimar shows pushed us off. And we went to the WB. And it was a very, very big show because, you know, this was in Living Color. Um, what was the other one? The, um, in Living Color. But, uh, oh, Simpsons. You know, they were very new. So we were on the air for seven years, which was a very big thing. So after three years, I finally got hold of Taj. And we did the show Smart Guy um, that was also on the WB. And then that kind of became my um, understanding that I, I have an eye for talent. So when Sister Sister went into syndication, uh, Disney Channel picked up and ran episodes of uh, Sister Sister and Smart Guy. So I called them up. I didn't know them. And I said, I'm Irene Dreyer. I, you know, discovered these kids and executive produced the show. I'd love to find something, you know, that we could do original. And he goes, oh, we would love that. And I said, what, do you, is there something you're looking for? And the guy thought he didn't know. He just said, okay, find me boy twins. I had just seen the movie Big Daddy with Adam Sandler 
and the, the uh, Sprouse boys. They were nine. I called up the manager. Hello, in my office. We went to Disney seven years of the sweet life and the sweet life on deck. So that's how that started off. So amazing. Oh my gosh. So while I was on that show, you know, when you're in Los Angeles and you are producing, I have 12 plates spinning because 11 will crash. So I'm always on to the next. So when I did the Sweet Life pilot, I brought in Dylan or Carl Sprouse to all the executives and they were fabulous. I mean, they were just adorable and funny and they were great. So two days later, I found a set of triplets in Dallas, <laughs> took them over to Disney. So wait a minute, Trip, double uh, Dylan Nicole, two days later, three identical looking twins, I mean, three some triplets. The head of Disney Channel says to me, what do you sit outside the maternity ward? <laughs> Very funny. She comes back so with a in triplet. The, <laughs> it was crazy, right? So in that pilot, there was an older brother. We were searching. I went to Orlando to all the kids that are there. We did everything just to find an older brother. Found him. Loved him. We made the pilot. They ended up picking up Sweet Life instead of this other one. But the brother on the show, who was like 14, 15, I said, you got to make a deal with this guy, this kid. He's unbelievable, like uneffing believable. <laughs> you are crazy. Oh, we didn't test that well. And he's a skinny. I go, please, I'm begging you. They didn't. It turned out to be Zac Efron. So that began my, <laughs> so funny. I had to write up a um, kind of a, a, a story about me and my bio and resume, what have you. And I added a page. I was right, they were wrong. Zac Efron was first. Second was, on Smart Guy, I had just seen this very pretty girl and her backup two dancers on Regis and Kathy Lee, because it was a while ago. I went, oh, they're adorable. So God knows how I got a hold of them. And we ended up putting them on an episode of Smart Guy. She was a, the main girl was unbelievably talented. So after that week, because, you know, when you're doing multi-camera, it's five days. I took her to every single network, ABC, then ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, and UPN. I mean, that's all there was then. She sang in the room. Her acting was unbelievable. And every one of those places, what do we do with her? Who was it? Beyonce. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, he's funny, Beyonce. I'm dying to no, I'm dying to run into her and say, it was me that launched your career. <laughs> it's like you you, you spotted oh her immediately. Uh -huh. Oh, my gosh. And the, and they, they didn't know what to it's do so with funny. her? They couldn't couldn't find a way to make a show? Oh, my gosh. That's no, incredible. they didn't They didn't get it. They didn't see it. I Okay. In every one of your newspapers, there are there's an insert of parade magazine it's a small little paper insert that everybody gets on sunday and there was a postage stamp size of these two best friends i'm sorry these two sisters and their best friend and they were playing uh, violins and guitar on street corners in dallas so i researched it got it you know hello and they were amazing. Their manager, he was fabulous. I knew exactly where I wanted to take this. So we had a, um, you know, an industry night at the Roxy, which is 
artists were all um, uh, music artists performed. They performed in every single no studio, nothing, nada. Who was it? The Dixie Chicks. I mean, like I said, I was right, they were wrong. <laughs> so you also brought the Dixie Chicks, Dixie Chicks to the Roxy. Well, I that, will well, applaud. Sorry, the end of the story. Yes, it was the Dixie Chicks. I'm sorry. <laughs> And, and at that, the that, Roxy, it was on Sunset. For our listeners around the world, uh, the Roxy is on Sunset, right? Yeah, yeah, it's famous. And it's where bands break. And I remember we had like trucks and, and networks and coverage. Nobody, nobody bought it. Cricket. Nobody. Crickets chirping for I the don't... Dixie Chicks. <laughs> you know, the most recent show I did, um, which is, very very special to me one day i'm you know looking on face on facebook and this thing went viral I, I no one sent it to me and it's this young african-american guy maybe 30 who's a dancer choreographer so my instinct is you know <laughs> am I am I too old? <laughs> Just I never had the dance career. Try, trust me, I tried. It never it never happened. So I'm looking at this guy. His name's Phil Wright, and he's teaching parents and their kids in dance classes. Okay, so I'm intrigued, and I click on it. There were hundreds of classes that he teaches with mom and the daughter mom dad and the son mom and the son mom dad it's amazing what happens is he teaches the choreography and then at the end everybody gathers around and there's a videographer who films it and they post it on Facebook. The Every one of these posts of a family were a million, a million, eight, ridiculous. I watched 45 of these videos. I started sweating, <laughs> I swear to God. I was like, I can sell this. I'm gonna make it a battle. And I did. I contacted Phil Wright, who's from Miami, Maryland, a Floridian. Oh, yes. <laughs> and we met. And well, well, first, I was like, where is this guy? It's it's on Facebook. He could be anywhere. <laughs> I face. Where is he? Sherman Oaks, which is eight mi six miles from where I live. So we met. I said, I'm gonna sell this show. So we cobbled together with his um editor. We made a three and a half minute video. I showed it to Disney. This is what it is, but we're gonna make it families. So it's grandparents and grandma, it's aunts and uncles and cousins. Anyways, it's called Fam Jam. Phil's, um, uh, his uh, classes were uh, parent jam. And I brought everybody down from Disney and they were freaking out. The good news is, we finished taping the two weeks, not even two weeks, 10 days before the pandemic hit. So we got an order of 20 episodes. And the last one aired uh, last weekend on, on Friday, I think it was. Yeah. But Fam Jam, it's wonderful. It was the most fantastic, wonderful experience as me, as the executive producer. And I... The, the letters, the things I got in response of this families were saying we were having a hard time together, but this brought us so close. We've tried therapy. We've tried vacations. This was the greatest experience. It, it, it was, you know, it still runs. I guess you can find it on Disney Channel. But so anyways, the pandemic just kind of shut that off at the moment. So, you know, oh. sad, great, and great, exciting wonderful thing which you know again i'm all about kids and you know many times um you know people ask me like how do you do it how do you get in my kid has got talent and they ask me she's so perfect for disney i said okay let me let me meet her she sings that's about it 
Disney doesn't care if you sing. They could care less. It's all about if you can be funny. So I am having these conversations with parents going, she's not ready. And the mother goes, oh, yes, she is. And I go, she's not 